Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our Kubernetes Masterclass this Tuesday, August 4th. As you can see, today's topic is Clear Path to Automated Optimization of Kubernetes Performance, which uh, will feature Carbon Relay. If you've attended a masterclass before, you are probably familiar with the format, but this class will probably run between 45, um, maybe 60 minutes. Please ask questions. Um, we're here to answer any questions you may have on the topic. Uh, use your questions panel that you can see on the GoToWebinar, um, sorry, the questions tab that you can see on the GoToWebinar panel. And we, are, we will do our best to respond to all of them. If you'd like to join the conversation, we do have a Slack channel just for the Kubernetes masterclasses. Uh, head over to slack.rancher.io and then um, search for the Kubernetes Masterclass channel. So as I mentioned today, our class will feature Carbon Relay, um, CTO, as a matter of fact, Ofer Idan. Ofer, you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Great to have you. Uh, we're really excited about uh, the topic you'll be covering today. Just a quick background about Ofer. Um, as I mentioned, Ofer is the CTO of Carbon Relay with um, a focus on applied mathematics and advanced machine learning technologies, which uh, he'll dive into a little bit more today. Uh, Ofer has a great experience. Um, he's native of Tel Aviv uh, with extensive military experience and has also had several senior positions at Boston Consulting Group and the healthcare startup Nav Health. So thank you again for being here. Without further ado, I will hand this over to you, Ofer, and we can get started with today's masterclass. Thank you so much, Connie. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today is uh, deploying and optimizing your applications on Kubernetes. Uh, I'll take you a bit through the journey that we at um, Carbon Relay have gone through when we uh, started uh, down the path of Kubernetes and some of the pain points that I'm sure a lot of you have experienced if you're already migrating or thinking of migrating to Kubernetes and then eventually how we solve them, how you can solve them uh, with your own tooling or with uh, some of the stuff that we, we have developed. So to start off, you know, I'll, I'll give you a brief background on us uh, at Carbon Relay. So we're still a fairly small shop. Um, we've been around for a couple of years and um, for the past 12 months or so, we've been heavily focused on the Kubernetes space. Um, obviously, the Kubernetes space has been taken off, and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, we are a very machine learning plus engineering focused shop. Um, we, we very much believe in the power of combining top engineering practices with advanced machine learning techniques. Um, we believe that either of those in isolation is great and um, is sort of uh, very powerful in its own, but it's the combination of the two that really, you know, jumps organizations and people forward. And we found, as I'll show you later, that again, the combination of excellence in engineering and advanced machine learning in the Kubernetes space, in containerized applications, in microservices architecture, really can sort of propel any kind of software development um, forward. Um, just to know, we we closed around uh, about $60 million last February. Um, so obviously we're rap rapidly, rapidly growing. Um, if anyone is interested, we're always taking on uh, great people that we'd like to work with. So with that, um, I wanna jump into the Kubernetes space itself. So I don't know how many of you are already in the space. You know, there's a wide range of experiences. Um, obviously Kubernetes has been around for a few years. I don't know if I would call it uh, a very mature product quite yet, um, but it's definitely maturing and it's maturing very rapidly. And the adoption we're seeing is, is almost exponential. So starting with containerization itself, we know today, you know, if you're a small shop and you're just building up your infrastructure as you go, you're likely already um, containerizing your application, likely on, on Docker, if, if we're being honest, but obviously there's a few other technologies in there. But even the larger organizations, if you look at, you know, uh, banks or, or healthcare, even um, insurance companies, whoever you want to talk to now, they all have the sense that containerization is the way of the future. And we know that we no longer live in a, in a world of monoliths where you have you know, some 
10,000 lines of code all sitting together, um, but having functional units to your architecture that focus on one simple task is the way to go. And extending that from microservices into containers is just the, the logical next step. Well, that is simply a, a manifestation of moving to the cloud, having flexible architecture, having things that are scalable and no longer tied, you know, necessarily to, to physical resources that you own. Now, as people have moved into containerization and uh, microservices, and as, as their architectures became more and more complex, the need for orchestration came in. And again, if you're already in the space, you know exactly that there's, there's some very low threshold, I would say, uh, of the number of services at which point you say, okay, I need something to manage this. Um, I can't just go ahead and tie five uh, containerized discrete services in some hodgepodge way. I need something scalable to manage them. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. So for, for those of you who don't know, Kubernetes is a, is a, is a container orchestration platform. There are others out there. Um, as you can see here on the right, Kubernetes really is becoming the dominant one. And we see it or its evolution as being the dominant player in the market um, you know, for, for, the, for the foreseeable future, at least for the next couple of years. The fantastic thing about um, Kubernetes and I think Rancher has been a big part of this as well as, as the ecosystem. Um, we truly believe that the, the most powerful thing about Kubernetes uh, and containerization and call it cloud native, if we're going broadly, is the ecosystem and the community around it. So all of you, um, I'm hoping will participate or already are participating in it. Um, we definitely like to, to play around then. And I think that is part of the reason why this is here to stay. Um, it's because people believe in the products and they contribute and, and the evolution of all these things is, is happening in tandem and happening um, sort of shared between people. So all that is to say, you know, Kubernetes is exploding. Docker um, containerization is exploding, so is microservices. What does it mean for, for you as a, a developer, right? I want to go ahead and, and um, move to Kubernetes, or I want to move to microservices, or I want to move to containerization. What does that mean for me? And, you know, joking, I would say, luckily, Kubernetes itself is very intuitive. You know, starting with Docker is, is, a, is a big step, um, may, may not be the biggest um, sort of hurdle out there. Um, there are plenty of tools that will help you containerize your applications today. It is somewhat of a difficulty, but we believe that the real, real, real difficult thing today is getting up and running with Kubernetes. And you can clearly see it in all the resources that are out there today. Everyone has some sort of platform either to teach you or to ease your pain when you're, you're getting on your first cluster, right? And, and our friends at Rancher are, are no different. There's, um, you know, anything from um, classes to resources that I'll talk about in a second. But even if you haven't stepped into the space yet, you already know um, just from looking around that this is going to be hard. Now, not joking, truly, um, the first step in your Kubernetes world, I do believe, is becoming uh, more and more accessible. And that is getting your first cluster up and running. So again, if I'm, if I'm looking at our partners and Rancher here, you know, there are managed services out there, both, both for the cluster in itself and um, for specific pieces of the, the cluster that you will need. You know, two or three years ago, if I needed the Kubernetes cluster, I would likely have to go and install it myself. Um, for those of you who have gone through uh, Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, you know how much fun it is. It's a, it's a great, great puzzle, I would say, not one that I would like to repeat on a day-to-day -day basis. And so luckily today, I can just go and with a click of a few buttons, I can spin up something on EKS or GKE, or even my own, um, you know, if I have my own hardware, I can go ahead and spin up a Kubernetes cluster with the help of, of Rancher's own Kubernetes service. So the first step, hey, I know I need to run my stuff on a cluster, um, we believe is, is well taken care of. So I have an application. I say, okay, I've broken it up into microservices. I now have separate pieces of code where they need to be. I've containerized them so I can go ahead and take it and deploy it anywhere that I want. And now I want to get it orchestrated. I want that application to the different pieces to play nicely. And I want it to perform well. We'll talk about what performing well means in a second. How hard can it be, right? You know, I'm not talking about something massive. You know, we can, I'll show an example in a second of something uh, which is very, very simple. If any of you who's gone down that path, I'm hoping you're chuckling to yourself right now because 
I honestly have asked that question myself. Well, it looks pretty straightforward. Kubernetes seems to be very flexible and can do whatever I want. Um, so I may as well go ahead and jump into it and, and deploy it. So I'll give you a brief taste of, of how hard it can be. And, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm gonna take a typical um, or a sample application, let's call it. Um, I hope some of you recognize this. Docker has a great example. Um, you can always go on, on GitHub, I'll send you the link later. They call the example voting app. I'm gonna call it the, the voting web app. Um, it is a simple five service sort of front end, you can call it customer serving web application. All it does, and I'll show you in a second, is allow users to come into the web page and then vote cats versus dogs. Are you a cat person or are you a dog person? And then takes those votes and it stores them in the database and it allows uh, me as the, as the admin or controller to actually see the slice of the votes. Super, super, super simple, right? Um, there, there aren't a lot of things that are simpler um, out there. We have, as you can see from the services, we have storage, we have the worker, the queue, and the actual back end that does the calculation of um, what is the percentage of votes that does cats versus dogs. So, like I said, how hard can it be? All I need to do is go in here. Docker even um, very helpfully provided me with the specifications. So a quick note for those of you who have never seen um, a Kubernetes manifest before, it's a simple YAML file that tells Kubernetes declaratively how I should be running my application. Um, so if I'm looking at a database deployment, it's pulling a particular image, you can have some environment variables in there, and I'll show you in a second, obviously you can have your resources defined in there. So all I have to do is download this and then go into my cluster and hit kubectl apply and just apply all the resources and see my application come up. Now, before I do that, um, I'll mention one thing about the, the Docker app itself. As I've just shown you in the file, it comes with no definition of resources. Uh, in the Kubernetes world, you have requests and limits. Uh, I won't go too much into this, but for those of you who know the interplay between requests and limits, basically what the application would like to have and you know the absolute maximum that it can have, it's called the quality of service. The way you define your uh, resources, requests, and limits um, will define what's called quality of service. Whether it's guaranteed, meaning the pod will be getting, the request and limits are equal, it will be getting the resources that it asks. If it's burstable, meaning it has a baseline level that it asks for, but it can go up to a certain limit, they're not equal. Or in the case that you just saw, if I don't define anything, it's called best effort. Um, I personally very much like that term because it is what it sounds like, which is the pod will, will get what it can, um, and it, it, it won't get what it can't. And that's, in my mind, not, not the best way to go ahead and deploy applications if you want them to be stable. So what I've done is I've copied the application. Um, you see here all the services that I have. This is another quick note on customize. We use customize for ease of, of deployment. Customize is just a way of declaratively um, managing your Kubernetes applications themselves. But if I go into the database, as you've, as you've seen before, I'm actually specifying the resources, requests, and limits for my different applications. Um, sorry, for my different services. So like before, I have a database, uh, a queue, a worker, a backend, and a front end, and now I want to go ahead and deploy it. I have my cluster up and running. Like I said before, super easy. I'm running this on GKE. I can probably count the number of buttons I had to click through. Obviously, you can go through the API itself. I have a cluster up and running. It's fairly modest. You know, If I'm thinking of myself as a sole developer, I don't want to go in here and sort of start spending hundreds of dollars a month just to get this up and running. So I, I want to make sure my application is running, but I also don't want to break the bank. So I have the cluster, I have the application. All I need to do, actually, I'm going to use customize in this case, is go ahead and apply all my resources. And you'll see everything come up. Great, I'm done. Um, I'm going to monitor this cluster for, for 10 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever. Um, as you'll see, I'm going to do most of my examples sort of bare bones. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff you could be doing on Kubernetes uh, with monitoring. You can do anything you're, you're, uh, you can think of. But even here, um, for 20 seconds in, most of my services are up. But, but something something's going on here with, with my voting service and my, uh, my worker, at least one of the replicas of the worker. And you know, I could wait more. Uh, I could start debugging. The easiest thing to do is just describe the pod. Let's see what's going on with the worker. Well, very easy. At least Kubernetes is being upfront with me. I have insufficient CPU and insufficient memory. Okay, 
back to the drawing board. Uh, maybe I should have done it all in, in you know, uh, best effort, but like I said, I want this to be scalable. So, you know, easy, fine. Worker is, is asking for too much CPU and memory. Um, let's reduce this a little bit. I'll go down to one core and one gigabyte of memory, and I'll just go ahead and apply it again. Um, for those of you who don't know Kubernetes, the nice thing is I don't actually have to do anything except um, going ahead and, and deploying everything. Well, the, the worker's up. Okay, good. The, the voting service still needs to needs to some change. So you know what? I'll, I'll just go ahead and do the same for the voting services replicas. Uh, and I'll, I'll drop them down a little bit. Let's go back. Okay, it'll bring them down uh, and it'll spin them back up again. And you know, if everything works, my application's up and running. I'll give it 10 more seconds and then we'll see. Obviously the next step now is to go ahead and test the application. Oh, looks like everything's running. It'll be ready in a second. Great. I am officially done. Now, depending on how my development is set up and you know how my, my pipelines are set up, I can either throw this over the fence to another developer or I can just go ahead and take this sort of um, all the way. So first, you know what, just for fun, I'm gonna go ahead and um, do some port forwarding here and show you guys what the application actually looks like. Do that with the voting service. This is the result service. So these are the two services that I have, right? One is running the actual voting service and one is running the, the results, which I'll use to look at the different results. So hopefully you guys can see these pages now. This as you know, an admin, I can see there's no votes coming in yet. So it's 50-50. Uh, I myself am a dog person, so I'm definitely gonna vote for dogs. Great, voted for dogs, the result services comes up, boom. I've already done testing, I'm, I'm done. Um, and again, I'm, I'm saying that um, sort of tongue in cheek, I'm not really done. I wanna make sure this thing is scalable. That's part of the point of, of deploying this whole thing. So I'm gonna be using a load test and I'm gonna be using a, a fairly simple one called Locust. Uh, it's an open source tool. Like I said, I'm, I'm doing this sort of bare bones. There's a lot of other ways that you can go ahead and do this. Um, but Locust itself is, is very friendly. What Locust does is, specify an endpoint, specify how many users you want and how quickly they come into your site. It's obviously very tuned towards web applications. Um, and then it just goes ahead and, and you know runs it. So I'm gonna go I'm gonna go low. I don't know if some some of you may think this is low, some of you may think this is high. Um, so I'm gonna hit my own port forward, the the basically the external endpoint of the cluster. A thousand users, you know, coming in at a hundred uh, per second and then launching a few a few requests at it. This shouldn't be too too crazy to handle. And um, let's go ahead and look at the results and you can see the votes coming in. We actually already missed it. Um, we had 961 votes already submitted. Locust is obviously still going, right? It's trying to, to go ahead and, and sort of um, attack the application as much as it can, but something, something seems to be stalling here. So I'm, I'm gonna go back, you know, like I said, this is not a very, um, fancy dashboard for monitoring what's going on. Obviously you want some more monitoring on that, but uh, yeah, obviously uh, my voting service is already kind of choking. And so now, boom, got some more in because I guess the pod was started. If I look at the, uh, if I look at the cluster, uh, there may be a few restarts here, not yet, but it just, it's, it's um, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a backlog, right? So I know that my users coming in are gonna have issues with their votes, not ideal. What do I do now? I go back to my manifests. So now comes the question of, well, how do I fix it? I know that I had a few resources that were set too high um, for the voting service and worker, at least, very likely on Postgres and Redis as well. I set them too low and now my application started choking. Well, now what? And you know, the answer to that is yeah, you have a few options um, and, and none of them are great. So what is the actual problem we're talking about? you want to not only deploy your application, um, but you want to tune it so that it performs optimally, right? And there, there are different ways of defining optimally, and I'll talk about it in a second when I talk about uh, what we call experimentation. But at the end of the day, when you're moving to Kubernetes from maybe a previous uh, platform like Swarm, or, or you know, even if you're just getting started, the reality is that you have a lot of things to play with. Right now I'm showing you something which is a tiny slice of my application, just resources and requests for two services out of five. And even then, you know, I managed to deploy the application, 
it already crashed on you know what I'm what I would call a minimal amount of users. Um, re realistically, I have tens of these parameters with thousands of possible um, values, meaning I have billions of combinations that I can choose from. And I myself don't want to sit there and have to manually tune them, um, sort of tweaking one, seeing how it goes, going back, you know, and, and going back and forth in this very, very manual process and hoping that my application, when it's actually deployed in production, will perform as I want it to perform. What I just described is actually the reason we've built our platform in the first place. Um, we were a Docker Swarm shop in the past. We moved to Kubernetes, and we hit the exact same problem. Um, I don't know exactly the amount of time and effort it took us, but I can tell you it wasn't, uh, it wasn't fun for anyone involved to go ahead and to, to go in and doing this manually. So where do I believe you should actually be doing an optimization step? Um, what I've shown you right now is, is something that is very typical for us when we either make updates or changes uh, to our current applications or when we go ahead and, and deploy a new application. We come up with the services and the containers. Obviously, we have unit tests on the code itself. Then we have some integration tests to make sure the pipes themselves are not broken. And then it's time to go ahead and deploy the application. So what you just saw is sort of the initial phase of what is described here is like the release process. And doing this manually is definitely not the way to go about it because we want our CICD and what we call now continuous optimization, the CICD CO pipeline, to be as optimal and automated as possible. I don't want to have to do this just like I don't want to have to run manual tests on my uh, in my testing suite on my actual code, right? No one today would think of running a CI um, pipeline that wasn't fully automated, at least if you're not, you know, just, just coming out of sort of a, a very small, small shop. So we truly believe that there's another step that should be inserted today into the CICD pipeline, pipeline and then as the optimization step. And now the question uh, that I've already alluded to is, okay, how do we do that? I believe you have three big options. The first one you've already seen, trial and error. It's the way most people do this today. Even if they're not aware of the fact that they are performing a sort of separate step, they are. They're going in, they're trying to tweak things. Maybe you do remove the um, quality of service re um, requirements altogether and you go with best effort, but then when you deploy in production, it comes back to you. So you're still in that trial and error mode. Um, I don't know anyone, I haven't heard any single developer tell me, oh, I love doing this. I absolutely love this trial and error um, method. The more reasonable way of doing it, I would call it, is design testing. Um, and me as a scientist, I'm very, very partial to what's called design of experiment, meaning you as the application developer, um, you likely have some insight into how your application behaves. If we're talking resources only, you might have uh, some sense of, well, this needs so-and-so RAM, so-and-so CPU, so I'm gonna go ahead and at least try that. Um, if not, try a range. So you can pick a few of your parameters. Let's say I have five services, I'll pick two of them. I'll pick the resources, the CPU, and the memory and the replicas, and I'll try to tweak those, right? I'll write myself a table and just go one by one uh, on that table and say, okay, I have 12 of these trials to conduct. I'll conduct them, I'll see how each one comes back. Um, I'll probably instrument my application to give me some sense of a performance metric, and then I'll see which one of those is best. So we actually already developed a tool to help you with that. Um, there's a, a large chunk of Red Sky is open source, and again, I'll, I'll give you the link later, but um, in a minute, I'll show you a controller that you can install in your cluster that helps you run these design testing. So you go ahead and you install the controller, you design the experiment yourself, and then you go ahead and you run suggestions manually of um, these different trials to, to go ahead and uh, run. And then you get the results back and you can tweak it back and forth. This is a good way of doing things. I, I'd say it's a, it's a significant step up from doing trial and error. Um, it's still manual, it's still somewhat arduous, and it limits you in the scope of the experiment that you can do. Um, I don't know anyone that can have you know five parameters with 500 different values in their head and still keep all of that straight in a design experiment. So you're really localized to small slices of your application. Up until now, I talked about resources, but you know resources is just the the tip of the iceberg. What if you wanted to tune a JVM? If I had a, a Java application running in the background, 
And now I split it up so that I have actually three JVMs to manage on three different services. Um, or if I had some sort of logging pipeline or data pipeline in general, that I wanted to tune for throughput. So now I need to talk about batches and batch sizes and delays and things like that. The applications become increasingly complex the more things you want to tune in them. And this brings me to the third point, you know, using machine learning for this. Um, I'll talk about the machine learning itself in a second, but the two core pieces of why we believe machine learning experimentation is the way to go is automation and intelligence. Um, that is not to say all of you in the room are incredibly intelligent, um, but your time and brain power is better spent developing and um, extending the applications that you already have and the infrastructure that you already have, not trying to guess what the right configuration is. A machine learning model has the ability to run this automatically, like I said, and in a way that explores the, the parameter space that I'll describe in a second very, very, very efficiently, much more efficiently than humans. Um, and obviously the end goal here with the automation is to tie it into your CI CD pipeline. So you go through your code testing, you go through your uh, integration tests, and then after that, you actually get into optimization so that the thing that is shipped out and deployed is optimal. I'll give a quick note on the machine learning uh, itself and why we believe it's a, it's a natural fit. I already alluded to this. So imagine what we're actually trying to do. If you look at the image on the right, you know, this is what I, as a mathematician, call a very simple space. Um, it's basically two parameters and one metric. So the X, Y here are your parameters. You can think of it as I'm tuning a single service and I'm tuning the memory and the CPU for that service. That's it. And I'm tuning for one, um, one metric let's say throughput, I want my uh, whole application to have as low throughput as, uh, sorry, not throughput latency, as low latency as possible. So I'm basically looking for these, the deepest troughs that you see there. As a human, I would have to manually explore it just like I described in the, um, in the design of experiment, right? I have to pick points on the X and Y axes and then try them out, see how high or low they are and decide, oh, this, is, this might be a local or a global minima. A machine learning model can do the same exploration of the parameter space, A, in much higher dimensions, and B, much, much faster and more efficiently than I can. You know, if I need 1,000 or 10,000 different trials to go ahead and find a, a local minima, not to mention a global one, uh, a machine learning model only needs a fraction of that. And, and I'll show you exactly um, what that looks like in a second. The nice thing uh, about this as well is that it's, it's completely prog problem agnostic. The, the machine learning model doesn't care if I'm running Postgres, or Redis or something else altogether or some crazy thing you guys cooked in your kitchen. All it cares about is what the parameter space looks like and what the uh, application behavior is in terms of the metrics. And so you can go in and apply it to any kind of um, crazy application and you guys can actually use your own domain expertise and your knowledge of the app to, to craft the experiment better, not the machine learning model itself. You can tell the machine learning model, hey, stay within these bounds because I know my memory can't exceed three gigabytes, or I know that you can't go below one, one core of my CPU or it'll crash. And then it brings it to what we actually do to enable this, this kind of machine learning powered um, experimentation. So what we like um, to enable people to do is to run these intelligent experiments. And that starts with designing the experiment itself. The experiment will determine um, what you're optimizing for. And I've mentioned this before, like what does it mean to be optimal? Well. Every application has a different de definition of optimal. For some of them, it's for throughput. For some of them, it's latency. For some of them, it's just error rate. Maybe you just want to reduce the error rate on your incoming request on your site. Whatever it is, whatever you can scrape, if you get it from Prometheus or some other data source, even external endpoints, you can pipe that into your experiment. The second thing you need to define is your parameters. Those are the things you're going to be changing across trials. Those are the CPU, the memory, the JVM size, Anything that you want to tweak and can expose, the experiment can tweak. And this is also where you put in some of your domain knowledge to say, hey, it doesn't make any sense for my Postgres database to have less than three gigs of memory. I already know that it doesn't make sense. So I'm gonna put that as you know, a lower boundary to make sure that the machine learning model doesn't even try to go below there. Once you've defined those two, you can go ahead and launch the experiment. And the way to do it is using two components that we've built. One I already talked about, it's the controller. The controller sits in your cluster and it will coordinate the experiment. So it will be talking to the second component, which is the machine learning API. And the controller will be receiving suggestions. Hey, try 
one core, three gigs, whatever it is, and spin it up. And the controller will actually spin it up on the fly. It'll spin it up, it'll run a load test against it, just like I did, and it will report the results back to the machine learning model. And the results come in, you know, one of two flavors. Deployment failed. This is an unstable configuration. Stay away from this slice of the parameter space because the application can't even survive there. Or, hey, this was a successful trial. Uh, here are the results in terms of the performance of the application. And again, those are the metrics that you've um, set before. This experiment loop, as I described it, get a suggestion, run it, report back, can be run completely automatically. At the end of which you're left with either a single optimal configuration if you have uh, one metric, or like I'll show you in the case of um, competing metrics, you'll get a, a menu to choose from. Because likely if, you're, um, if your metrics are not correlated, then you're gonna have to have some sort of a trade-off. And I'll show you that in a second. Obviously doing it this way means you're freed to go do much, much better things uh, than sitting there and you know, looking at logs. And like I said, since it's so efficient in exploring the parameter space, you don't have to wait a week for this. This could be done in 10 minutes, an hour, a day at most, depending on the complexity of your, your application. So with that, I want to revisit the, uh, the, the Docker web app. I'll show you the experiment in a second. I'll, I'll describe it very, very quickly. We're looking at 10 parameters overall here. CPU, memory, and replicas for all the services. Some of them have um, a, a combination of them. Metrics, um, throughput. So we want to get as many votes in as possible, right? And the overall resource utilization. So like I said, you know, if I'm a single developer, I don't want to, you know, uh, um, T2 extra, extra large to be able to run this. I want to run this on reasonably sized nodes. So we're actually using like a cost proxy from GK to tell me how much this is going to cost me every month as a, as a single developer. And the load test we use, I'm going to use the same locust that I've used before. Um, only I mount it inside the cluster with every trial. So I don't have, even have to do anything. I don't even have to go here or do nothing. Um, as you'll see, it all, all, all runs automatically. So let's go back to our cluster for a second. So I'm gonna kill these two services. Uh, I'm actually gonna go ahead and shut down the application that I've had before. Shut down Locust while I'm at it. And now I'm back um, to a clean cluster. So again, clean slate. I want to start this experiment from scratch, but I don't want to do this uh, manually. I want to do this intelligently. So let me go into the experiment file itself. So the experiment definition, um, here is where, like I said, I'm de defining, based on my knowledge, what the different parameter values, uh, or at least the limits for the different parameters need to be. So the worker memory can go below um, 0.2 gigs. Same for the CPU, I already noted if I drop to about uh, 0.1 cores, it's getting unstable. So anything below that would just be foolish. And again, for every single other one of them. This is where I define the metrics as well. One of them is throughput, which I get through an internal service in the cluster. Uh, and the other is what I call the cost proxy. It's just a cost proxy based on CPU and memory utilization, telling me you know how big my nodes should be or how well I can fit this application on a node. And then the rest, um, is simple. You guys can go ahead and read this in, in our documentation as well. Just how do I patch it and how do I load it? So again, the load test here um, is just simply coming from um, Locust. And so I'm, I'm using a, a public image of Locust and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and mount it myself. With that, super, super easy. I need to install the controller. Like I said before, our controller is open sourced. Uh, we have a CLI tool called Red Sky CTL. And all I need to do once I download uh, the CLI itself is run Red Sky CTL in it. And this is going to take, I don't know, 20 seconds, I'm going to say. Um, you'll see a new pod come up here with a Red Sky system namespace. Um, that will be your controller. Again, completely open sourced. Um, there it is. So 30 seconds overall, you now have Red Sky Ops in your system. Of course, you have to go ahead and, and define your experiment. I've done that sort of ahead of time, like a, like a good cooking show. Um, and the last thing that, that you will have to do is, is one of the following. As I mentioned before, um, we want you to use the controller to run your own design experiments as well. So you can go ahead and run trials using Red Sky CTL Suggest. So Red Sky CTL Suggest will allow you to put in specific parameters and uh, parameter values and say, hey, run this sequentially and you'll mount the suggestions and you'll see them come up. Instead of doing it manually right now, um, I'm already logged in to uh, our 
demo tenant. There we go. As I'm already connected to the machine learning model itself, all I have to do is run all my resources again, including the experiment. So both the experiment and the trials are actually kube objects. So when I run this, um, you'll see a new experiment come up and I'll show you in a second. You'll see all the pods come alive. I didn't even have to, to um, do anything. And there is going to be a uh, load running against them. Is sort of uh, in the background here. Now, what you're seeing now is our first active trial. The controller already reached out to the machine learning model. The machine learning API came back and said, hey, try this uh, configuration, which is akin to saying, try these parameter values. And the controller spun them up. I have a feeling that my first trial already failed because it's tried too low resources and it already came back with a new one. Um, obviously, I don't want to be sitting here and looking at my cluster all day. So we also have um, a nice set of results um, UI. There it is. And you can see the voting app example that I've run um, has already started. No trial is completed. So you'll see no trials. I'm going to say this is probably going to take uh, between one and five minutes. So instead of uh, staying here and sort of staring at it, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll pull up one that I've, I've run before. So this is the exact same application. It's the Docker voting web app. Um, this whole experiment consists of 200 trials. So each one of these dots that you see here is, is what I called the uh, trial before. And a trial is just a fancy word for a particular configuration of parameters or typical values that I have assigned to the parameters. So what happened here is the machine learning model said, hey, try this value for the database CPU, database memory, Redis CPU, and so on and so forth. And the controller spun it up. And it ran the application for about five minutes, hitting locust against it, and measured the two metrics that we've defined ahead of time. The first one is throughput. So again, just votes per second. Uh, and the second is cost. How much is it going to cost me in dollars based on the cost proxy that I, that I put in there? And once it was done, it sent it back to the machine learning model, and it suggested a new trial. And it kept on going uh, until it hit 200. That is just a um, sort of a heuristic that we suggest, you know, running 10x the number of um, 10x the number of trials for every parameter you have. Well, I should say 20, 10 to 20. And then at the end, you know, this could take a couple of hours. I think this runs uh, easily overnight. Um, you're left with this, you know, what I would call a lovely picture. Some of you may not like it as much. What is the point? Well, the point is you're left with this, that, this collection of points that we deem best, right? So these red points are the ones that the machine learning model calls dominant points, meaning they cannot be beat on both metrics at the same time. And that is the throughput that I've, that I've alluded to before. If I want to have a web application that can fit as many uh, incoming votes as possible or as quickly while maintaining the lowest possible cost, well, I'm not going to have one, right? I can't have something that is very, very performant and very, very cheap at the same time. What I can have, though, is a really nice trade-off curve. You can say, you know, I'm capping my cost at 80 bucks a month. That, that's how, how much I'm alive. Okay, great. Cut off anything before that. Here's my highest possible throughput that I can get for 80 bucks. Same thing you can say, you know, if my business is setting me uh, a particular goal to hit at least 50,000 incoming votes per second, okay, then I'm cutting it off at 50,000 votes, and here's the cheapest possible configuration that I can get for getting a throughput of 50,000 or above. And more than that, I would say, this is a perfect place to see how your application behaves overall. These two cliffs, or the cliff and the plateau here, um, for me are great insights to say, you know, there's no point beyond a, a certain throughput. It's just getting wasteful to throw more resources at the problem. And I'm probably better off left somewhere here. Whereas if I'm seeing myself at the 20,000 um, throughput, 20,000 votes mark, maybe there's a place to throw in another 10 or 20 bucks a month to actually bump me more than 5x in my performance and still maintain sort of reasonable costs. This kind of process, running a unit test, running an integration test, moving straight into optimization, and then coming back and finding the deployment that works for you and deploying it is exactly the kind of process that we expect um, the whole ecosystem to, to move to. And obviously, we're working to automate this and, and have it generate um, you know, what we can perceive as the best manifests going forward. One thing I haven't even mentioned is the concept of unstable configurations. And actually, I wonder if my nope, my voting app is still not done. Probably take about um, 
five more minutes or so. Um, but in the event that a configuration doesn't actually load, well, the machine learning model takes this into account. In, in the case of this experiment, it actually didn't. Uh, every single trial ran. But if you want to tune um, the JVM, actually, I'll show you this inside Elasticsearch. We tuned Elasticsearch just by itself. Um, and even within it, we tuned the heap percentages for two of the nodes, um, the, the data and the client nodes. Inside Elasticsearch, if you mistune um, or misconfigure, I should say, your JVM, you're absolutely going to see unstable configurations. And if the machine learning model has managed to only get you know, 30 out of 160 total trials, I guarantee you for humans, this number is going to be way, way, way higher. And it's going to be way more painful to actually tune um, the JVM in this case. So all that is to say, uh, I highly encourage all of you to have the idea of continuous optimization in your mind, even if you're not quite there yet, even if you're not on Kubernetes yet, I would say. Even if you're only in the first stages of uh, getting your stuff into microservices or getting your stuff containerized or just getting started with Kubernetes, be aware of the fact that once you move into these more complex um, dynamic systems, just running unit tests and integration tests is no longer enough. Um, and I, I highly encourage you to come talk to us. You know, we, we'd love to um, coach you on how to start with it, you know, either by yourself or with an open source tool or something that you build, or obviously um, with, with Red Sky Ops, we truly believe that um, we can help pretty much any developer out there. So someone asked, how does your machine learning model collect performance metrics during experiments? Um, great question, thank you, thank you for that. We have numerous ways of, of doing it. You know, the most basic one is collecting metrics from, from within the cluster. If your performance metrics can be collected by something like Prometheus and, and you already have it instrumented, that's the best. But we're actually building more and more integrations into tools that are in the ecosystem. Um, you know, specifically, I can talk to our, our partners at, at Datadog. They have a great collector. Um, you can just pipe in um, your Datadog integration and just pipe metrics from there. And if you have a specific metric collector uh, that you're interested in, um, come talk to us. We're, we're building these integrations um, all the time. Same question, does your ML model depend on the monitoring tool I use? No, it doesn't. Um, we actually, we, we are looking to ship this with Prometheus. So you'll have Prometheus inside the cluster, even if you don't have it instrumented. We would rather rely as much as possible on our internal tooling and not have you have to build more stuff. But in the case that you have more stuff, um, you know, obviously we can go ahead and instrument it. So someone asked, some life system configuration uh, would be low, therefore services would be slow. Um, so how to influence these experiments in the live system. If, if I understand the question correctly, what you're asking is, you know, in, in real life, in production, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of noise uh, and the, the services may be slower than they are uh, in dev, that is true. There are multiple ways of addressing it. And I think we're moving in a certain direction that um, we believe to be the right case. There are two things you can currently do and I believe you should be doing. One is run as many experiments as you can on the different um, the different components of your cluster. If you have a multi-tenancy cluster, they have multi multiple applications that run there, go ahead and optimize every single one of them and then run, try to run them in tandem. Um, we're also enabling the ability to run multi-tenant clusters ourselves. I can tell you from an optimization perspective, it's harder to optimize um, sort of many concurrent metrics. But the other thing that we believe um, we should and are moving towards is eliminating the noise in, in schedule, right? So the first noise you have is coming in the load tests and we're working to solve that. The second piece of noise you have is, is uh, coming in the scheduling and we're actually looking to optimize uh, more native components like the scheduler, like the HPA, like the VPA. So you can have uh, not just your application optimized, but also the, the different components that are sort of managing it. Someone asked, uh, um, can I give insights on the type of machine learning algorithms uh, we use? Uh, a magician does not reveal its secrets. Uh, no. So I would love to have a very deep discussion with all of you about the machine learning algorithms. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not at liberty to tell you exactly what we use. Um, for those of you who are well-versed in machine learning, um, it may be a bit obvious to know, you know what kind of um, optimization techniques we use. These are, I'm going to say, our own version I'm, I'm going to be, uh, you know, shamelessly uh, plugging our machine learning engineers here. We're using our own cutting edge version of something that's been very established in, in the optimization and operations, operations research world. But more specifically, I can say our ML algorithms are very tailored 
to this specific problem, uh, the the problem of black box optimization in a in a in a high parameter space. Uh, would you be able to share with us the manifest file and package to simulate in our environment? Absolutely. So um, this is actually link number four on the slide that you see here. And again, we'll share all these links with you. So I encourage you to go to our docs website. The two bottom links you see here on GitHub. The first one is the controller. And the second one is what we call our recipes. The voting web app is one of those re recipes. So you can just go ahead and run it um, yourself whenever you want. And I believe that is uh, all the questions we had. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ofra. This was a great presentation. Um, thank you for being here today and for all the attendees for tuning in. You know, if you guys are interested in getting set up with um, Kubernetes clusters, head, head over to rancher.com to check out all our products. You know, everything's open source, so you can figure out how to get started there. We do have a couple upcoming classes here. Um, next Tuesday, we have our next Kubernetes masterclass featuring Jay Frog. And on Wednesday, um, our August online meetup will take place. Um, we're giving a preview of the Rancher 2.5 EKS lifecycle management. So head over to rancher.com slash events to check them out and get registered. A couple additional resources for you. Um, if you're interested in becoming a certified rancher operator, you can do so at academy.rancher.com. And thank you again to Ofer and the Carbon Relay team for a great masterclass today.